Welcome to BIV Today, the daily podcast from the newsroom of business in Vancouver. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief. A bit of a different podcast today. A couple of weeks back, I got an email from Rachel Fexton, a public relations professional here in Vancouver, offering to write an opinion piece for us on the challenges her business is having in getting their clients' information into the media. Fair enough. You know, From my perspective, I actually find it hard at times to get out from under the siege of public relations professionals offering to publicize their clients. So I thought maybe instead of getting an op-ed piece from Rachel, although I will take one later on if you want, but I thought it might be a good idea for us to have just a good conversation that might benefit not just the two of us, but also our two occupations and the challenges of navigating in this era of abundance. Rachel Thexton, principal at Thexton PR, joins me. Nice to see you. Hello. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah. Well, look, um, Happy to be here, but you're, you know, you like me have some kind of central frustration right now in this time. It's it's not all that easy to get the message out, and from my standpoint, to stop the flood of messages coming at me. So, uh, tell me a little bit about how difficult it is for you right now. Yeah. So, I mean. You know, since the age of digital has come upon us in the media world, things have, have been constantly evolving and changing in PR. And, you know, we've been learning new skills and learning to communicate online. But I would say that the biggest challenge, um, in my opinion, has been the changing media newsroom. And that is, you know, the constant layoffs, the shrinking staff, where we used to have an abundance orders um, to, to pitch and approach. Um, now there are very few uh, and the ones that are working are extremely busy, often overworked, doing multiple beats. So really the challenge is how can we um, have a mutual beneficial relationship where we're able to provide information that's beneficial to reporters without annoying them, overwhelming them, wasting their time, um, while also kind of having them give an eye to our ideas and potentially that being you know a story that could be useful to them. Yeah. How do you think it's changed, though, just simply beyond the numbers of people that you're dealing with all the time? Because, yes, I think most newsrooms have, you know, have shrunk. Ours actually has grown. But uh, and I think we're we're lucky in that we're we're still a company that is growing at the moment in terms of its numbers. But uh, but by and large, I'd say you're right. You know, uh, most of the big places are now uh, medium places and um, and getting smaller, getting smaller all the time. So it, what have you noticed? Is it just that you don't get calls returned? You don't get emails returned? Well, I mean, I've been doing PR in Vancouver for about 17 years. So I have good relationships with media. Um, it, it's rare that I won't hear back given the long time that I've been doing this work, the relationships that I've developed. But what I do hear often from reporters um, who I know is, you know, Rachel, this story looks great, looks interesting, would love to do it, just can't happen right now. Or next week, we'll try to draw my attention to this. Um, yeah. Or often the other challenge that, that's, um, that we're seeing through some media outlets is the encouragement to buy sponsored space. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah. Sponsored content or other paid paid placement. I, I mean, I will say that we're uh, we're part of that. Uh, we take in now um, a certain amount of sponsored content. We limit the amount that we have at any given point because we don't want uh, it to to so occupy space mm -hmm. that um, that it might even displace some of our journalism. So so we've added space in order to accommodate it. But a lot of places are clearly using it as a bit of a substitute. Mm -hmm. And and I'd agree with you. I think that some places are saying, listen, that that's a story that is more of a you know, it's more of a service story. Um, and it's more of a it's almost like a biographical story of, of of the client. So it's you know, it's a profile of a great president or a wonderful company or whatever. And and you know, most of the newsrooms now just don't have the resources, if they ever did, to to go and do that, and um, I mean, they can barely get out from under to go and and pursue their own uh, ideas because there's so also so much staged for us right now. It's it's extraordinary, right? I mean, it, you know, governments, other institutions that, that don't even you know hire uh, you or others have their own apparatus to uh, to stage a lot of content and to keep journalists, I think, 
almost on a uh, pretty much a, a hamster wheel with this stuff every day. No? It's it's disappointing. I mean, my uh, my my education is in journalism, so that was my area of study in university, and I, I shifted throughout my career very early in my career to, to public relations. But you know the journal PR is having to adapt, and and part of that is deciding with the client when is a story more suitable for sponsored placement more of a you know we have to look at um, where it's it really does merit a news pitch for earned press versus mm -hmm. sponsored and that's something that um, the client and the PR reps kind of have to come together and learn that we're in an evolving landscape and we have to accept that there's room for both and there's value in both um, and yeah. I think what you say is true is really making sure that the paid and marketing part of things doesn't overtake um, the ability to be able to pitch genuine stories. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's not something that I'm seeing in the mainstream press um, at this point yet in Vancouver, but I certainly in some of the niche publications, I've had that experience where it seems to be, you know, pay to play or, um, or really mm. there's not much to discuss. So I think that's kind of where yeah. there's a danger. Yeah, and I've been very dismayed at times to see, uh, see some places not label it properly. Because I don't think that that helps anybody. I don't think that it helps the client. Um, uh, you know, it certainly does not help the reader um, understand that this actually was provided uh, from outside the organization and um, and and was created in order to you know, make a little bit more illustrious, you know, the the credentials of somebody or the the performance of somebody. And there wasn't the same sort of lens applied to it that that a journalist would apply. Or, or other sources in a story that a journalist might employ in order to tell a story that it's you know it really is coming directly out of a company or out of a an individual, and it's it's you know it's it's sheer publicity. I, I will say also I, I think that I think that generally speaking there can be a mistake made with sponsored content, and I think and I think this is where I hope that it actually evolves um, is is out of that biographical journalism into the application of their expertise, because I, we're craving expertise. Uh, and, and it may not be that we have today the opportunity to do a story on, you know, six tips to properly do your taxes this year. But, but there are experts out there. And if they want to get sponsored content across the media, they then have that great opportunity to apply their expertise, build a reputation, provide a legitimate public service in doing that. And ultimately, I think there is a, there is a, a small victory in there for everybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, some of the pitches we still get around sponsored content are, are very much uh, in that, you know, uh, what a wonderful person my client is. And, and, and it may be a wonderful person, don't get me wrong, uh, but, but it's, it's like, likely to not be read as well as something that really applies expertise. For sure. I mean, I think the danger that we have as, as communicators in, in PR is that we we sometimes get wrapped up in that um, enthusiasm in the marketing department, right? And, and you know, we love the storyline, the product's great, and we kind of, we really have to take ourselves out of that box and, and remind ourselves kind of uh, what is news, where is news, if any, and if so, kind of how do we uh, how do we work with that or not? How do we look over to the sponsor piece? I agree. I mean, although the pieces may look great to the client um, in news that way, um, it's not your third party endorsement that PR was designed to provide, right? It will it'll be an ego boost for the client, but not so much uh, perhaps that what they had hoped to be, um, you know, to help with sales or brand building or, or those things. And yet, I also feel for public relations practitioners because clearly you know in, in some cases clients th that's really just what they want they want publicity and they 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 want to they want to enhance their reputation as quickly as possible and they think that they've got a good story to tell on their own and uh, and you know why why can't i get you know a, a big mainstream media operation to do a profile on me because you know i i am that good and that's why they they then probably lean on people like you uh, to, um, to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I think that that's worth exploring, and I think you alluded to it at the beginning, was just the the busyness that you're now encountering. And I think a lot of that was brought on, um, and and I'm to blame for it as much as anybody when in managing 
through uh, the digital transformation is, uh, is just the notion that you're using social media in such a way now to publicize your work uh, as it's evolving in the course of a day. And you're, you're often going to Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn before you're even going to your own publication to reveal some of the information that you've got. Uh, and, and that kind of stack up is pretty phenomenal. I mean, there's no, no doubt. Um, it, uh, you know, it, I, I thought actually it was going to be uh, like a pure positive for us when we started doing this 15 years ago. And now what I see is that um, you just keep stacking up these elements um, in order to do it and in order to, to widely publicize your work. And then you don't realize that at the end of the day, you've lost um, a fairly significant fraction of the time that you ought to be frankly talking to people, digging out material, exploring it, calling an extra person or two on every story that you're doing. Um, and and that, that part is lost quite a bit, quite a bit. You become a, a, a marketer, a self-promoter, a digital promoter all in one. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm surprised that journalists haven't got public relations people in some cases to uh, build their own brands out. Yeah, because that's, that's what you're doing. You know, you're building a brand all the time and you're trying to accumulate followers and followings that I mean, ultimately, they help your organization because they drive work back to that organization's website or, or in this case here, you know, a, a, a clip of some sort. But, uh, but ultimately, it takes time away. Um, when we got into convergence as a, as, a journal, as a craft in journalism where some of the people were working in print and could suddenly do television uh, or vice versa, um, you know, what, what we didn't really take a look at was how that was drawing them away from perhaps their, um, their central uh, capability. They may have been great writers, but not particularly wonderful TV personalities sure. or terrific TV personalities, not superb wordsmiths, you know? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that, I think you're experiencing a bit of that too, huh? Yes, I mean, it's it's a matter of, you know, I was having a conversation the other day about about the fact that I had been promoting clients for so long. Um, and we're now in a landscape with a lot of communicators, you know, a lot of former journalists are moving to communications as well. Um, that, uh -huh. that I had kind of uh, really lapsed on on really promoting myself and what I've been doing here for almost two decades. So certainly, yes, it's a matter of kind of I, I'm in I'm in the same position uh, I think as the reporter and having to kind of always be promoting my work and what I'm achieving, although there is a level of, of privacy as well to what we do. So there's you know some of the things behind the scenes, maybe crafting messaging or helping with crisis communication, where we're not as as able to talk about publicly and kind of showcase that work. But um, certainly a lot of a lot of self promotion is needed on this side as well. Uh, the, cri the crisis communications uh, era uh, and the work that you do inside that is to me a little bit distinct, right? Because you're, because that's when really you're pretty indispensable. You know, we, we as a craft need to get access to people who are either making decisions or, or guiding particular responses to things that are taking place, yes. um, you know, business leaders, uh, institutional leaders and so on. That that to me is still um, largely unchanging in terms of the uh, of, of the journalist piece of that. We're still still in need of the same kind of access, if anything, swifter access. And um, I think it's more the story pitch, where where really there, it, it's a lot harder to get those kinds of things placed. I mean, you, you almost have to catch a journalist on a truly quiet week, uh, if there ever is one, um, and, and hope that, you know, they're just, um, it tweaks their interest and they, they've got a day or two to spend on it. No, I think you're right. I mean, I think there's, there's certainly, the only thing that's really changed with crisis communications, in my opinion, is obviously the immediacy. So, you know, sometimes, as you said, reporters will be tweeting about what they know so far. Um, or mm -hmm. there will be, you know, a lot of digital bits and pieces that are flying around in the space. And, and sometimes it's um, 
also, um, you've been a lucky newsroom or, you know, done a great job of really growing in, in your space, but there are newsrooms where people who are covering a certain beat may not be as familiar with it. So for example, yeah. where we would have had a really knowledgeable real estate reporter 10 years ago at a certain publication, perhaps that person has just kind of is balancing a little bit of business, a little bit of arts, um, and they may not be as, as knowledgeable in the industry. So it's a matter of really being able to guide your client to give them um, in layman's terms, like, you know, explain exactly what's happening here, why it's relevant, et cetera. So some of those challenges around uh, reporters who are multitasking in different storylines and different beats. Um, yeah, and then managing yeah. the digital fallout from it all. Sure. Yeah, that, that makes some sense. I mean, look, uh, generally speaking, journalists are generalists, you know, and uh, we're, you know, we're not terribly uh, uh, specialized. Uh, there was a time when it looked like we had so many more specialists uh, in the field. And I think we, we crave specialists. We crave that. Uh, we, we need um, former doctors to be writing about medicine. We need, you know, uh, people who've been called to the bar to be writing about law, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we don't, we don't have that anymore. I, I want to raise one thing with you, which, which, uh, you, I think you alluded to a little bit earlier, which is I, I'm finding though, that an awful lot of decision makers and an awful lot of the people that are their communications people, first of all, they want to know every question that you're going to ask them in an interview, right? They like, there's no, there's no kind of, surprise that is going to take place in this. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and then, and then there's also this, uh, and, and I noticed this even with the students that I teach at UBC sometimes is, is, a, is an acceptance that you can do your job by email with each other. So you can do an interview by email and then that's going to be okay. Yes. And there, this is where you get to call me old school, uh, because, because I, I just don't, I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy either of those. Yes. Well, I mean, first of all, if I can just speak to the questions in advance, if, if a client asks me that, and they often do, um, I cringe inside. Um, in my opinion, as a communicator, it's my job to balance. Um, obviously, I'm serving, serving my client. Um, they're, you know, my, my most important um, relationship. But right on the tail and almost closer equal is my relationships with reporters. Um, and yeah. the last thing I want to do is irritate, overwhelm, um, annoy uh, a reporter who's working hard at their job by, you know, asking them to, to provide me a full transcript of the interview in advance. I think as a communicator, it's our job to look at the reporter, who they are, what they've written in the past. You know, obviously, I think it's, it's fair to have some context as to what the interview will be about to make sure that our spokesperson is prepped and to make sure that you have the right person speaking to you. But really, it's the communicator's job, I think, to draft out those questions based on the conversation they've had with you and looking at previous work that the reporter has done. Um, let's not give the journalists more work. Let's, you know, keep that relationship as positive as possible while providing our client with the prep that they need. So, yeah, I'm not a fan of, of you know, very unique circumstances. I think the questions in advance are suitable for a sponsored piece where you're doing maybe a sponsored Q&A. Of course, mm -hmm. then you'll have everything in advance. But, you know, that level of control um, is common in requests from executives. But I think when they have an experienced communicator who can really put them at ease and, and have them prepared for any question that they're going to receive on their topic, they're, they're better prepared uh, either way. Um, in case the conversation goes this way or that way, they're, they're better prepared to kind of have a whole scope of training on how the interview could go. Yeah, because I, in my experience, the CEOs of the world, you know, the political leaders of the world, the high profile athletes, the big, you know, rock stars, they're really comfortable in their own skin. Uh, they, they're, they're frankly, they doubt that you can put anything over on them. So they're, they're pretty good. It's the um, it's kind of the people in the middle, I've always found, that mm -hmm. that you know are still going up the career ladder, uh, have you know are are just worried that they're going to misstep, and so they want the safety net that comes with knowing what's going to take place, and they'd like to do interviews by email. Why wouldn't you? Because you get to, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh yeah, like you, yeah. you get to frankly edit yourself before you're finished a sentence. Like that's fantastic. I like doing yeah, that in writing. And that it's often me who's having the interview with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, 
I'd like the opportunity to do that, you know? So, so yeah, it, it, that part, that part's a little worrisome because I, I can see that now becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger thing. And, and this is especially true in government. Government loves the idea of you emailing your questions. They're going to email you back the answer, the statement, right. and, and they're not going to get into the danger if they want it from their standpoint of having a spontaneous conversation where what they say, you can then ask them something else on. Um, they want, what's your four questions? We'll get you four answers. And, um, and we'll consider that a, an acceptable transaction. And I, you know, it's, it's the fault of the journalists for accepting this in the, in the beginning. And now we're we frankly conditioned people to expect it to be acceptable as a practice. Yes, so. I think the mistrust, I think some of the senior executives I work with have an apprehension, kind of a, a, a low level mistrust of media in a way they're, they're fearful that their um, quotes will be taken out of context or that they will be, um, you know, taken yeah. into an area that they're not comfortable. But again, I think it's really the PR um, reps job to, to make sure that their client has really tight media training and that they know how to have that conversation and, you know, answer questions yeah. that they may be less comfortable answering. So, so in conclusion, I mean, what do you think you need to know from a journalist? Um, like, what what's the better dealing? Because because it sounds at times as if someone has almost dusted you a little bit and said, "Sure, sure, Rachel, I'll, like, uh, yeah, leave it with me," you know, and then and it just vaporizes. Um, what what is it that you're looking for out of a out of a journalist to, to have that relationship where there's still the opportunity to kind of agree that you're not going to do something and and see you know the you know see each other a little bit more clearly but you know keep that keep that relationship going and not feel like you got burned or promised something that wasn't delivered or or you know it, tell tell me a little bit about that yeah so i mean my my second favorite response from the from a reporter is no because so you know <laughs> i'd rather hear no because there's just no way i have time for this maybe in June or no, because this is way too promotional and why Rachel, you should know better, you know, than to pre present this. So, you know, I'm fine with, with a no, and I actually appreciate it. It doesn't have to be long and take a lot of time. So just kind of really honest feedback would be great um, because then it, it helps. I think it helps us as communicators to be better at approaching press with things that are, that are relevant to them and really working to get them exactly what they need. Um, the honesty is great. I think any, PR pro that doesn't want that is um, is not going to go uh, very far in their relationships and in their in their career in this in this field. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I will say that's very common to me too, which is I I like the idea of um, of a public relations professional just accepting no, mm -hmm. and uh, and and so I don't feel reticent about doing that if I say, you know, time or it's not it, it's just not in my interest. It's outside of my ambit. Um, I don't see any of our reporters being able to do it. I, you know, I think that that's fine. If a, a professional at the other end saying, "Okay, your your call. I'll be back. You know, I'll come back to bug you in a couple more days." You know, mm -hmm. it's fine. It's all right. Yeah. I can deal with that. What any any one big tip for us as communicators as to kind of what we're still doing that just drives you nuts? Well, I, I you know, it, it's the vanity press piece that I think. Um, we just don't have time for anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's like if, if we ever did, so we we just can't we just can't go there any longer. It's not it's not just the resources um, uh, of the, the number of reporters. It's the amount of input that we have now. It's the amount of opportunities that we have to do all kinds of things. And so maybe twenty years ago you could do that. Maybe maybe you're like yeah you know because I see you know we we have very few inputs today. And we've got a lot of people around. If, if all hell breaks, breaks loose, we've got people to do it. Um, you know that. You know that that window now has has pretty well shut. So it's more like you know bring the expertise, bring it in a timely way, um, and uh, yeah, it, and kind of be accepting that maybe the interview or the discussion with your client isn't necessarily going to get published right away. Maybe it's for future consideration. So maybe it's something to stimulate an idea a little, a little later on, because um, there, there can be time for that. So, yeah. Anyway, 
it's a good conversation. I'm glad glad we had it. I hope we kept everyone's interest in it. And um, you know, we'll do it again. Sounds good. All right, Rachel. Good seeing you. Adding. Good to see you. Take care. Kirk. Rachel Thaxton is the principal at Thaxton PR. I'm Kirk LePoint, publisher and editor in chief at Business of Vancouver. Thanks for watching BIV today.